if my biological father was capable of a child who was a stranger, what would have happened to me had I grown up in proximity to him? Would I have survived my own childhood? You go by Rutherford now, when we can get into why that is later, perhaps. Your birth name was the same as mine, Andrew, as, as I suppose luck or serendip serendipity or fate might have it. Um, what was your early childhood like? Because I, I know that you, um, you, you always knew you were adopted. What does it mean to always know that you're adopted and how, and how is that? Well, um, good news and bad news, I suppose. Um, because I was raised um, in a profoundly dysfunctional um, adoptive family, um, the good news was that it meant that by knowing that I was adopted, I didn't carry the genes and the legacy of those people. Uh, and therefore, I wasn't bound by or condemned to um, the kinds of um, features or traits or personality quirks that are on the nature side of the nature versus nurture debate. Um, and as a result, it, it allowed me, as, as is not uncommon with a lot of adopted children, uh, the opportunity to believe that my, my real parents uh, would have been better people, would have been more intelligent people, would have been more loving people, would have been more supportive people. When I found out about my bio biological parents, I found out that, well, suffice it to say that wasn't the case. Um, but knowing that I was adopted provided me with a sort of emotional out. Um, the disadvantage was, and once again, this is not uncommon with adopted people, um, feeling as if I was dropped from Mars. Um, because one of the things that um, most of us rely on as, a, as an element uh, in our sense of identity um, is a sense of belonging to, to a family, to a tribe, to a culture, uh, to a society. Um, and being adopted, uh, you are deprived uh, of any meaningful sense of being part of uh, a continuity, being part of a progression through time. Um, and it... Uh, you'd think after... After 40 years or more of struggling with these issues, I'd be able to be clearer and more succinct, but it's, it's, it's always a struggle to, to put what is a really complex series of, of, uh, emotions and ideas and notions into words. It led me, uh, to, to look for a sense of belonging, um, in the only thing that I knew about my heritage, which is that my biological mother was English and my biological father was Scottish. And, and therefore, um, I turned to, uh, the tales of uh, English history and English uh, mythology uh, for a sense of um, belonging, uh, because it was the only was the only option available to me. It provided me with uh, both a semblance of a notion of kinship um, and a, a great uh, longing or a great desire to one day to be able to stand on some place on the planet and say my people came from here. Um, it took me many years to figure out where that here was. Um, in the end, it turns out that that here wasn't particularly impressive. Um, but it was, it was a kind of psychic lifeline, I suppose I, I would put it that way. Had, had your adoptive family been uh, more loving, do you think some of these issues might not have been issues for you? Um, I suppose it's possible. I've, I've met um, a number of uh, children who were adopted and who came from very supportive, very loving, very accepting homes. Um, and uh, they professed absolutely no interest whatsoever uh, in seeking out their biological heritage because they felt that there was nothing lacking. Um, in their sense of identity and their sense of selves and their sense of connectedness. Um, and I, uh, I, I envy them that. Um, but for me, it was always uh, very important to try and um, find out a little bit about uh, the past of which I was, I was going to say an end product, but a, a mid-stage that, that I, I wanted to be able to, to turn backwards um, and get a sense of the the lineage uh, of which I was uh, of which I was part.
you write about that your adoptive family or your family you grew up with they w- physically beat you um what was that like and why do you think they wanted to adopt a child if they were going to be like that well what was it like you ever been beaten up it was just like that um mm, no yeah well then you're lucky um <clears throat> It was, it was only my adopted mother. My adopted father was, let's just say, distant, um, but not, uh, not a destructive force. Um, my adopted mother was a very destructive force, um, very frustrated, very angry, um, and um, I was her whipping boy. I was her, her scapegoat. Um, I, the, the reason that they adopted children uh, was because back in the 50s, yes, I'm that old, uh, back in the 50s, um, to have a boy and a girl uh, made the stereotypically perfect family. Um, and my adoptive mother was always looking for reinforcement from, from outside uh, to prove to her, because again, she was a, a profoundly unhappy, profoundly uh, unfulfilled, profoundly angry uh, woman, uh, constantly looking for external sources of validation. Um, and when occasionally, as children do, um, they don't perform, uh, when they don't do as, as is expected in order to um, serve the ego needs of a parent, um, this particular parent uh, became very frustrated and hostility and anger and frustration from a variety of sources in her life uh, was channeled um, uh, onto my back, onto my buttocks, on, onto the backs of my legs, and onto my face. We, we all have childhoods which are in, in various ways and uh, uh, difficult, um, unhappy. Um, the question is not, uh, to me, um, the, the question is not... Um, how did this impact me? I mean, yes, it did, and I've spent many years working it out. Um, but the, the question to me is, was I going to allow that uh, anger and frustration uh, to take root um, and ultimately give her victory over uh, the kind of person um, that I became? Uh, or was I going to try and... and um, find some way to be free of that legacy um, in order to be happy. And I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm pleased, I'm happy uh, to be able to report um, that I found a way to be happy. That is amazing. Well, it's something that very few people, even with the perfect childhood, struggle to, to get, you know, to find a way to be happy. So that's really something. And you did it, I suppose. I mean, there's always talk, there's always going to be that de- debate about nurture versus nature, um, how much we're a product of, of our genes and how much our environment. And of course, you are, as we'll find out, unfortunate in in both so it's a it's a marvel that thanks a lot to, yeah. you know make us make some semblance of a life let alone be happy so it's really something but you had this really unique experiment because you got to learn as an adult so we're going to fast forward a bit about the interests and temperaments of your biological parents um and, and and this was before you actually knew who they were i believe is that is that right and they were sort of told what they were like and that kind of thing and and no and did you notice striking similarities yes um as as your listeners uh, your viewers will will uh, recognize my accent is not british um canadian if you please not american I, uh, andrew you know this but just for the, for the listeners um if i were to say out and about that probably will will put it to rest um i was uh, i was born in toronto of an english mother um during a short period of time Um, between uh, her departure from the UK, her arrival in Toronto, and her ultimate um, uh, travels on to New York City. Um, Actress on Broadway, but we'll get to that. Um, So during a brief sojourn in the city of Toronto, um, she birthed me um, and gave me up for adoption through um, the administrative body in the city of Toronto in the province of, in the province of Ontario that deals with adoptions. Um, and the, the legal status, uh, the legal entitlement to information 
uh, for children born in uh, Canada, born in uh, the province of Ontario, is very different than it is here in the UK. Uh, at the age of 18 in the province of Ontario, one is entitled to what is called the file of non-identifying information. Uh, and this includes things like uh, your mother was English, your father was Scottish, um, your mother uh, had these political interests, had these academic interests, um, she was this height, she was this hair color, that sort of thing. Uh, so enough to give a very, very vague um, sense of the, the, the kind of person, maybe not, I shouldn't even say the kind of person, but a very vague sense of the person that she was, uh, and an equally vague sense of, of my father, uh, my biological father. Uh, because he was not involved in the adoptive process, um, he, uh, he, he did not recognize me at birth. He did not uh, attend any of the uh, meetings with the social worker. Uh, the file on him is, well, thin. I'm, tr I'm trying to think how to how to do this because obviously you know who your father turned out to be was quite quite shocking and but I, I, I want you know do we leave it for later but it's going to be in the title of the episode so, I mean you're the director <laughs> yeah but I don't know what I'm doing none of us do do we um, but yeah let, let's should we just go into it then because otherwise it's an elephant in the room isn't it so tell us about what you later found out about your father let me start by going backwards a little bit. Um, from the age of about 18 or 19, uh, once I was eligible to receive this file of non-identifying information, I, I did request it, I did get it. Um, it was unsatisfying in terms of the kind of detail that I wanted, because quite frankly, what I was looking for was enough. Uh, it became an 18-year search. Um, now, there are a couple of interesting aspects of this. And, and as you've said, we're recording this, uh, so feel free to edit, edit out any details that you think, well, that's you know, too arcane. Um, one of the first things that, that I did was that I joined a, a non-profit organization, a, a voluntary organization of uh, adopted children and of uh, parents who had given children up for adoption called Parent Finders. Uh, it's an entirely voluntar voluntary organization. It brings people together. It offers suggestions and clues and moral support and so on and so forth. It turned out that by the time I attended my second Parent Finders meeting, a month later, I had found my birth mother. We, we managed to find um, the name and address of someone who had shared a house with my biological mother back in the early 70s um, because we discovered and anyone who's listening to this, who is engaged in this kind of a search, may find the following tip really useful. We discovered that in telephone directories and in municipal directories, people tend to use the same configuration of their name. So for instance, if you are uh, John George Smith, the first time you get a telephone in your name, you might register it as John G. Smith or as J. George Smith or something, we found that overwhelmingly people retain the same configuration in their listing. And so if you're looking to track somebody down and you're looking for somebody who appears as John G. Smith, and several years later, there's another listing of J. G. Smith, it's probably not the same person because people tend to retain the configuration. We, we managed to, to, to find... Um, an administrative trace of her in 1971 and found that she shared that address with somebody else. And she then disappeared off the municipal record, couldn't be found. We later discovered it's because she moved to New York City, but she disappeared. But we were able to, to, track, to track and follow the name of the person with whom she shared this residence. Went home that evening, I called him, I called the number and this, Elderly gentleman answered the phone and I said, uh, good afternoon, I'm looking for bleep. Um, and he said, yes, that, that's me. I said, well, you have to excuse me. Uh, I'm not actually looking for you. I'm looking for a woman with whom you shared a residence on Hilton Avenue in Toronto in 1972 by the name of, and I gave him my mother's name. And he said, well, I'm still in contact with X. 
Stellar. I, I'll name her. I'm still in contact with Stellar, uh, but I'm not at liberty to give out her current address. But if you'd be kind enough to give me your name and telephone number, I'd be very happy to pass it along to him, or to her, rather. And I paused. And it's one of those moments, you know, this, this sort of thing doesn't happen very often, that somebody asks you for your name and you don't know what to say. Most people know their names. But I thought, if I give him my legal name under which I live, and she, he passes that along to my birth mother, that name is going to mean nothing to her. And so I said, my name is Andrew John Bennett Hamley. And there was a pause. And then he said, oh, you're her son. And it was the first time in my life I had been the son of my biological mother. And I said, yes. So he said, just a minute, I'll give you her address. I took a few deep breaths. I called directory assistance. I asked for the listing of Stellar Bennett at this address in, in Delaware. They gave me the number. Was your heart racing? It's a funny thing. There were three of us in the room at the time. My wife and daughter were sitting on the, on the sofa two meters away in floods of tears. And I was entirely calm. I don't react emotionally in the moment. I react afterwards. So I'm entirely calm. I think probably smoking three cigarettes simultaneously might have had something to do with it, but, but I, was, I was entirely calm. So I called the number. This elderly English lady answered the phone. And I said to her, I th I'm afraid that this is, this is going to come as something of a surprise. She said, no, 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 dear. I know exactly who you are. So-and-so has just telephoned me to tell, you that, tell, tell me that you're about to call. I don't think I have ever been as impressed with someone's presence of mind as I was at that moment because I had called him out of the blue. There's no way in the world he would have expected my call. But in that moment, he had the presence of mind to give me her name and her address, knowing that I would have to contact directory assistance in order to get her telephone number, which gave him a window to call her on the telephone and warn her I was about to call. It's also um, the kind of the, the kind of thing that maybe a lot of younger listeners might not appreciate because nowadays it would all be, you know, Instagram and Facebook and what have you. As an interesting footnote, um, this gentleman, um, Alan, died six months later. This search had taken me the better part of 18 years. If for whatever reason, that search had been delayed by six months before I connected him to her. The one link that would have made it possible for me to, 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 to contact her would have gone. There's serendipity for you. Um, so I telephoned her. And we had, we had an interesting conversation. We arranged to, to meet. I knocked on her door on my birthday. Now, everybody meets their mother on their birthday. It's just usually not your 37th. So I met my mother on my 37th birthday. Um, and um, she, in our uh, reunion, in our, in our meeting, uh, explained to me uh, that the reason why Alan was so uh, protective of her and not giving away her, her telephone number readily is because she, for her entire adult life, had been afraid of being tracked down by my biological father. So here's the segue. She explained to me uh, in this meeting um, that a couple of years after she left Toronto and moved to New York, my biological father um, was found not guilty by reason of insanity of a vicious child murder in Toronto um, and had been sentenced to uh, life uh, in a secure psychiatric facility. Just before I gathered together half a dozen photographs, me as a young child, me as a young man, my wife and I, my wife and daughter and I, and sent them to her in an envelope. She did the same thing in return. And when we, when we arrived back in Toronto, there was an envelope from her with photographs of her, her parents, and the one photograph that she had 
of my biological father. Um, at the beginning of this conversation, we were talking about some of the implications and consequences of growing up knowing that you're adopted. Well, one of the things is that you never have the opportunity to look at another person in the face and say, uh, I know where the nose comes from, or I can see where the ears comes from. Come from. Um, when my daughter was born, I was 22, and this was the first time in my life I had ever looked into the face of someone with whom I shared blood. I'd never before seen someone with whom I was related. Um, and so when we got this envelope of photographs, the first photograph I looked at was that of my biological mother. I don't look much like her. But out came a passport photograph of my biological father at 22, and it was frightening. Well, maybe that's not the best word. It was remarkable how much I looked like him. Um, and this turned out to be um, a shock to my biological mother when we first laid eyes on one another, because she looked at me and she saw him. Um, and she'd been, a, she'd been terrified of him for all of the time that they were together and for all of the years subsequently. Um, and so that was an additional layer to the difficulty in us connecting. Yeah, I, well, I, I bet. And so given what he had done as well, I mean, that must have been incredibly disappointing to spend decades and decades looking for, you know, and it's nice to see the picture of him. And then he's a child murderer. Um, one of the ironies in all of this uh, we were we were speaking a little while ago about some of the characteristics and trait the nature versus nurture thing and some of the things that I have inherited if that's the term from my from my parents I don't know and I will never know whether my propensity for anger um, comes from him biologically and therefore is a nature issue or comes from my my adopted mother and therefore is a nurture issue. But all my life I've struggled with my temper. Fortunately, um, I have always managed to refrain from actually striking anybody. Um, but all my childhood, all my adolescence, all my young adulthood, uh, I have a fierce temper. Uh, I would throw things, I would hit things, I would break things. I've got a voice that frightens when it's in that mode. Fortunately, as I said, I have never ever struck anyone. I've managed to pull myself back from that, but I have been aware and my wife and daughter are very well aware that I've struggled with anger and my temper. And to find out about my biological father was, was a shock. I'd always wondered, what is it that allows for some searches of some adoptive children to, to flow like water. You start a search, two weeks later, you, you connect. Whereas mine took 18 years. Um, I'm not one that readily um, projects meaning and significance onto events. But at the same time, some events do have meaning and significance. Um, and so I'd always wondered, was there a reason why my search was so long, why it was so fraught. And it was remarkable. I think there's no other word. It was remarkable to discover um, that by meeting my uh, biological mother on my 37th birthday and finding out about my father on my 37th birthday and finding out about his crime, which he committed when he was 36, on my 37th birthday, I am convinced that had I been successful in this search much earlier, had I connected with her and found out about him, for instance, when I was 22 or 23, and knowing about his crime, I would not have been able to resist, probably more subconsciously than consciously, projecting at least the possibility or the prospect of that kind of a, a future. Um, onto my own destiny. I suppose um, it can work. I mean, firstly, I just want to say about the whole abortion process and that that abortion process is that a Freudian slip? 
It is actually because I just released a documentary about <laughs> I just released a documentary about abortion. <laughs> so I won't I won't take that personally. <laughs> God, I'll have to think about whether to cut that or whether that's funny enough to keep in. It's but, funny enough to keep in. <laughs> <laughs> the whole adoption process is so philosophically wrought, you know, wrought with complications and things. I mean, it's such a good thing in so many ways, but also for someone to grow up and not have that kind of, you know, knowledge about their parents. As you say, you might have gone that way. You might have gone even further the other way. You know, it's so hard to know. Sorry to cut you off, but the most obvious thing um, that I, I realize retrospectively is that if my biological father was capable of murdering a child who was a stranger... What would have happened to me had I grown up uh, in proximity to him? Would I have survived my own childhood? That's that is a what a no, but what a point, what a point that is. My word, the the kind of things you must lay up at night thinking about, and you know, really something. I, I do think I'm a strong believer. We need. Our, our parents, we learn as much from the amazing things they do as, as some of the things that are maybe the, the, the issues they have and the things where you go, oh, God, that's me. I do those things that my mother or father do. And you didn't have that. You weren't able to have that from a young age. So it must have been really difficult to not be able to look at them and go, God, am I starting to sound like my mother? Am I sounding like my father? But I also completely, you know, I understand what you're saying as well, that it, it could have made things much worse, just particularly growing up under his care so to speak what more do you know about um what he, what he what he did why this particular child was it was there a sexual element or anything like that he was living in a uh, hotel for vagrants um the hotel has a long history it was once upon a time a very prestigious hotel in downtown toronto but um since the 1960s, it had gone down market and it had become um, a hotel for vagrants. He was living there at the time um, and um, apparently went to a local uh, market, not a supermarket, but a, a local market uh, a couple of miles away, bought some groceries um, and paid uh, a young boy um five dollars or something to carry the groceries back to his hotel uh, the young boy was doing this as a regular thing in order to save up some money to buy his father a birthday present um, so my biological father lured him back to uh, his hotel sexually assaulted him and murdered him and then went on the run um, the the two things uh, the two documents artifacts uh, that my mother was able to share, my biological mother was able to share with me was the passport photograph that she'd already sent me uh, in the mail uh, and a copy of a newspaper clipping uh, detailing his arrest. Have you? Sorry, go ahead. No, just whether you, uh, if you've given much thought or, 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 or been able to find out more about his mental state. Was he a psychopath? Was he a schizoaffective disorder? I'm just throwing things out there. Not too much. Um, he's clearly, from what I've been able to read between the lines as a reasonably educated person, he, he's either a sociopath or, uh, either a sociopath or a psychopath. Um, the, the difference, as I understand it, is that a psychopath doesn't know the difference between a right and wrong, and a sociopath knows the difference, just doesn't think it applies to them. Um, I did make an initial tentative inquiry a um, couple of months after finding out about him uh, through the uh, Department of Justice and Prison Service in, in Toronto. Um, he, he was held at a secure psychiatric facility out along um, quite a distance outside of, outside of Toronto. Um, and I explained to the, um, to the prison psychiatrist who I was, why I was calling... <clears throat> And, and explained that I was thinking about, I hadn't yet decided, but I was thinking about uh, the prospect of making some kind of contact with him, either through letters or coming up to visit once. Uh, and I asked the psychiatrist, do you think this would be a good idea? Do you think that it would be good for me? Because you, you know his current state. Do you think that he would be a psychological danger to me if I were to meet him? Uh, is he you know, particularly intelligent and um, and manipulative? So do you think this would be a good idea for me? Do you think this would be a good idea for him? And he explained, not surprisingly, um, that I, 
that I was asking him for classified information, information that was confidential about his mental state. Um, and so he said, I'm perfectly prepared to answer your questions, but only with your biological father's permission. So I need your permission to, to, to go and see him and explain that I've been contacted by your biological son, um, who's interested in the possibility of some, some sort of contact with you. Would you be willing for me to, to, so the psychiatrist asking my biological father, would you be willing for me to share some information about you with him? Uh, and after several long conversations with my wife, um, we decided that it would not be a good idea uh, for my biological father, A, to know of my existence, um, and B, to know that I was expressing any, any kind of interest in contact with him. So I contacted the, uh, contacted the psychiatrist again and said, let's just let it drop. Um, so I know very little about him. Uh, I did, because of course, after 18 years of searching, I, I had become rather adept at finding out information about people. Um, and so I, I was able to, uh, to look through some uh, subsequent court records, which are in the public domain. Um, I looked through the record of Hansard. Is that the same term that's used here in the UK? It's the parliamentary, so it's the, it's the, um, transcript of parliamentary debates because my biological father, yep. his, his case came up in a couple of parliamentary debates. Um, and it turns out that uh, several years after he was um, incarcerated in a secure facility, um, he was deemed eligible for day release. Uh, and very shortly after, I don't know if it was the first day or the second day or the or a week afterwards, but, but very shortly after he was uh, given day release, uh, he attacked a woman with a knife. Fortunately, he didn't kill her, but he attacked a woman very seriously with a knife. So back he went inside again. Um, and that's the last I've been able to find out about him. Um, I hired a private detective a couple of years ago uh, to try and find out, can you tell me, is he still alive? Um, can you tell me anything about his family? Because my biological mother did tell me that my biological father had at least one sister. So is there family there that maybe I can use my, my skills to, to track down? Um, and um, that short story, that really didn't, didn't lead anywhere productive. Uh, so I, I know nothing. I, I expect that uh, it's possible that he's dead, um, but I have no way of knowing. How old would he be now? Do you even know that, like his date of birth? He'd be um, 80, mid-80s. So it's, it's, it's possible, you know. It's just, the, it's just the, the craziest story, really, to track down your father and to find that out about him and, and also that you bear certain similarities with temperament but it does sound like i mean what he has is some form of mental illness so regardless of temper it, it appears that you don't have any of that or, or or do you have any sort of things you worry about in that respect i uh, i struggled for years um with issues of self-esteem uh, as most um uh, adopted children do not all but but most um for the very simple reason that uh our our biopsychology you know the 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 way that the human brain is wired um seems to be designed in order to ensure uh, a primary bond between mother and child Regardless of the degree of love and support, regardless of the, the capacity of the mother to manifest that love in a healthy way, it seems to be one of the, the, the features uh, of our species. And the problem that a lot of adopted children struggle with is that the one person who is supposed to have loved me unconditionally gave me up. Now, a lot of adopted children um, are able to, to deal with this um, by assuming, un until they're presented with evidence that either confirms it or, or contradicts it, um, most adopted children make the assumption um, 
that there must have been a good reason. You know, she loved me so much, but was unable to take care of me, and so gave me up with the best will in the world in the hope that something. You know. um, and in part, I'm sure that is an attempt to to think as well as possible of the the mother who who did this otherwise inexplicable thing. Uh, but it's also largely um, an aspect of psychic self-preservation because if you are unable to assume or believe or trust that your biological mother gave you up for the best will in the world or with the best reasons in the world, if you're unable to, to come to that conclusion, the alternative is, well, I'm clearly unlovable because even my mother wouldn't take care of me. And so a lot of adopted children uh, struggle with this idea of being sufficiently worthy. Uh, we struggle with abandonment issues. We struggle with the, the idea or the belief or the lack of belief um, that we are lovable. Um, that was certainly a, a really significant uh, feature for me. Um, I didn't believe that I was lovable until the most remarkable woman in the world proved it to me. Has it affected how you raise your own daughter? Oh, yes, um, absolutely. Um, um, I think, I, think I, I, I probably overcompensated in some ways and at the same time was probably, there was no probably about it, there's no doubt that I was unable to uh, to protect her uh, from some of the uh, issues uh, that as a result of my adoption and particularly uh, as a result of uh, the family environment in my adopted family. Um, I've mentioned already that I struggled with my temper. Um, I never struck her, ever. Um, but I know that I frightened the bejesus out of her sometimes uh, because sometimes as a result of unresolved stuff, uh, stuff leaks out. Um, and so when she was quite young, uh, I went into therapy because I thought if, if, if I don't find a way to deal with my stuff, I'm going to cripple her the way that my adopted mother crippled me. Um, and fortunately, um, while there are some scars there, uh, she's a much healthier, uh, much more emotionally stable person, uh, than I was at her age. And that's largely down to her mother, uh, my wife, um, who mothered us both, uh, who saved me and who protected uh, our daughter. Do you, do you think your ad adoptive family knew uh, about your father or anything like that? No, no. They, they didn't know anything at all about my biological heritage other than what was uh, contained in the file of non-identifying information about my mother being English, my father being Scottish, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, they did not uh, take kindly uh, to the news that I had spent time looking for my biological family. Uh, now, when I was a young teen, my adopted parents divorced. Uh, and as a result, my relationship with my adopted father became much better. Um, he was a wounded man, but he meant well. Um, and for that, I, I owe him a great deal. Um, he could not cope with conflict and therefore was not in a position psychically, emotionally, to be able to intervene when my adopted mother was beating me. He just retreated. And so there are some issues there that, that fortunately I was able to discuss with him on his deathbed um, and let him know that, it, you know, you could have helped there. Um, anyway, he and I made peace. Um, my adopted mother's family and I, however, it's a very different story. Um, when, um, when my adopted mother found out somehow, I didn't tell her, but she found out somehow um, that I'd been engaged, I had been engaged in this ultimately successful search uh, to find my biological mother. Um, rather than um, accept this as something that is perfectly natural for an adopted child to want to do, um, she considered, she and, and her mother, who was the real matriarch of the clan, uh, considered this uh, treason. Uh, and when my grandmother, my adopted mother's mother, uh, died, 
Um, I attended the funeral um, and my adopted mother sent her younger brother as her emissary to me at the wake. He walked up to me. I should mention my adoptive mother named her youngest brother. And when I was born, she named me after him. He walked up to me, looked me in the eye and said, so what do you call yourself now? Turned on his heel and walked away. Uh, it was being made very clear to me that I was no longer considered a member of their clan because I had betrayed them by initiating this, this search. Um, fine, screw you. So I'm no longer in contact with uh, her side of the family. Um, it's funny, I, I, I started off with, in a way, two families, biological and adoptive. Um, now I don't have any except the family I've created for myself, and that's fine. Um, because, uh, like the Rolling Stones once said, uh, you get what you need, but not always what you want. Uh, what I wanted uh, in reconnecting with my biological family was an opportunity to to feel validated, to feel accepted, to, to belong to a clan. Um, I didn't get that. Um, but I got what I needed. I, I found out about her. I found out about him. Uh, I found out the kind of person she is. Uh, I found out about the kind of person he was, even less nice. Um, and so I'm I was able to fill that gap. I was able to fill that hole. Uh, I didn't get what I wanted. Life's like that. Uh, but I got what I needed. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Is your, is your mother still alive? Which one? Uh, so I'm sorry, that was a bit of a cheat uh, in, in reply, uh, because my answer is no idea. And it applies to both of them. Well, you're... Because that, I mean, that was the bit we haven't touched on too, too much, but we don't have too much time. And I wanted to get on to your dad. I wanted, you know, that, that's the... That's probably the more out there of the two. But your your mother was was just not interested in, in your life, but you did get to meet her and hang around with her quite a bit. Are you happy you at least got to have that time? Was there, is there any positive from that? Nope. Um, other than getting, getting a bit of the truth, um, my biological mother, uh, as I mentioned, um, left Toronto after being there two and a half, three years uh, for New York. Uh, had a career on Broadway. Very, very minor uh, career. Kissed Laurence Olivier. She kissed Laurence Olivier twice. Mm. Was a good friend of a couple of other actors. She she was infamous for name dropping. Uh, but she was one of those people, we've, we've all met them, for whom others are not really real. Others exist only as, as, a, as a resource. Uh, and in her case, it was as an audience. Let me give you just one anecdote, which I, I think uh, both clearly and powerfully typifies this. When we drove down to, to Delaware to meet her for the first time, I brought with me uh, a family photo album. Uh, it hasn't come up in conversation yet, but I'm a photographer. It's what I do. The day job as an academic that puts food on the table, but but photography is my way of talking to myself. So I make photographs of things. I document things. Um, and um, I have um, generated uh, over the years a series of family albums. Um, and so I brought a couple of the family albums down. I didn't expect her to, to look in, uh, adoringly at every single photograph in the album. But, but here's a sense of me as a kid, me as a teenager, and so on and so forth. Um, of my wife and I getting married, of the birth of our daughter, and that sort of thing. She flipped, I think the term absent-mindedly would be appropriate, through the first three or four pages, looked up at me and said, I'm bored. I mean, firstly, how can you be bored getting pictures of your long-lost child who spent 18 years trying to find you? That's the first question. Second question is, even if... In, in some bizarre universe, you are actually bored. What would possess you to actually say it? Fine. Okay. I was, uh, as I mentioned a little while ago, in, in moments of stress, I'm centered. So, fine. Okay. She got up from her chair, went into the next room, came back with a shoebox full of about 250 photographs, all made the evening 
of her 21st birthday, and she insisted that we were going to look at every single one of them and get a full description of exactly who everybody is. So we sat through that. Now, well, that, that's, that's a very interesting contrast. Then she got up again and she went and got her, her book of press clippings and presented it to me and said, read that or read these. So I started to read them. She, no, 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 no. Out loud. Okay. Now, as you were kind enough to comment at the very beginning of our session, I have a voice that many people have complimented. Uh, radio technicians, when I used to do audio recordings, say that I have a good face for radio. I think, wait a minute, that's maybe that wasn't as polite as I thought it was. Yeah, anyway, I told the same. So I started to read it out loud. I got about three sentences in. She snatched it back and said, you're reading it wrong. Your breathing is all wrong. I thought, really? Is that, is that what this is about? You know, it's, it's not about sharing the, the audience's reaction or the critic's reaction to the quality of your performance. It's about me performing for you. And the last thing, uh, you know, there were, there were dozens of moments like this in the two days that we spent together. Um, the last, one well, of the last things she said to me before we left is that she requested, uh, two things. One, um, that my wife and daughter and I cancel our imminent plans to move to Nice in France, which were two months away. In two months, we're moving to France, um, and move instead to Delaware. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Delaware. If you haven't, don't go. I mean, it's, it's not, there are some lovely places in the U.S., but, but Delaware, uh, is just factories and wasteland. Uh, so one, she insisted that we, we move to Delaware. And secondly, she insisted that we legally go through the process of changing our family name to match hers. And I thought, no, we, we're not, we're not really real to you. We, we approached her. I approached her, um, with a powerful insight. Um, and I think this is probably the, 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 the summary of the whole thing for, for the 18 years that I had searched for her, my conception of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it was in order to get a connection, to get a family, to get a sense of belonging. But two weeks, maybe it was only 10 days, but it was a very short period of time before we stumbled upon the telephone number of this guy in Vancouver who connected us. It occurred to me like a bolt of lightning. No, this is not about what she, if we're, if we're successful in finding her, this is not about what she can give me. It's about what I can give her because she may be alone for all I know. I've got a loving wife, a wonderful child. We can give her a family. And within a couple of days, things just started to fall into place. And it was as if, and I realize this is going to sound a little metaphysical. It's as if the universe was waiting for me to figure that out. That's one of the reasons I think maybe it took as long as it did. That and the, the issue with finding out about my father. Because as soon as that thought occurred to me, everything fell into place. Um, and so I, I approached her. Uh, with the idea of, of welcoming her as a part of our family. But she made it perfectly clear and repeatedly clear that she wasn't interested in, in being a part of anything. All she was interested in was, oh, good, a new audience. And this one is captive because he's my son. He has to listen to me. Really? I've got news for you, lady. Uh, cause I spent 15 years, uh, soaking up the anger and frustration of one frustrated English woman. I'll be damned if I was going to go through it again for her. Bloody hell. And I mean, you, you were dealt a very rough hand, I think by anyone's standards, but you've made a great go of life. I, I think you seem to be very happy now. You have your own family. Well, I, I suppose, and this is probably quite a difficult question, but for, for anybody who, who has grown up, anyone who's listening, who might have a family that's very, very difficult or, or, you know, who they can't get on with at all, what advice might you have for them? Well, um, firstly, Look after yourself. 
um, your own emotional health, your own happiness, and the happiness of the family you have chosen to have has to be paramount. And if maintaining contact, maintaining relations with the family into which you were born poses a threat or jeopardizes the safety, the love, the security, the well-being of the family you have chosen to create, the choice ought to be easy. Um, I realize that for a lot of people, it's difficult. Um, but for me, and I speak only for myself, um, becoming estranged from my adoptive family was the smartest thing I ever did because there was nothing there but, but guilt and expectation and shame. Uh, and it occurred to me, why do I need this? Uh, so look after yourself, look after the nearest and dearest that you have chosen to have in your life. And if those that you happen you know, through happenstance uh, to be related to uh, are not able or willing to contribute to that, if they're not willing and able to, to enhance the quality of the love and the protection and the security uh, and the happiness, then let them go. Let them go. Rutherford. You've been on The Edge. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hi, I'm Andrew Gold, former BBC journalist. I got a little tired of restrictions over who I could interview and what I could say and do, so I made this channel. Click this playlist here, and I'll be seeing you on The Edge.